Uh, so, first of all, I would like to just say a little something to you in one of the two languages of my land, which is Māori, and that is a simple greeting, which goes something like tanakoto, tanakoto, tanakoto kato, which means hello everybody, guten tag. That's the entire extent of my German. Uh, my, if I have a second language, it's Spanish, but that's not a lot of use if I spoke to you in bad Spanish. <laughs> So I'm just going to prove that the English language has many variants and you will find my accent difficult because we haven't had big international soaps on television like the Australians. But it's a variation of an Australian accent. It's not the same. If you want to tell us from Australians, our accent is flat and theirs is sharp. So, for example, an Australian would say, I came over on a ship from Sydney. <laughs> and a New Zealander would say, I come over on a shop from Sydney. <laughs> okay, I'm exaggerating, but that's, that's the difference. So, I'll try to go reasonably slowly. Now, I have here a much bigger PowerPoint that's available to all of you if you want it. We've now, thanks to Sonia Sharp, I corrected a little technical glitch on slide 15, which I'm not showing you. But if you want it, I can make that available to all of you. And the other thing is I am putting into your library, and I'm pretty cross with my university press, they didn't do it, the second edition of Environmental Histories in New Zealand. The first one came out in 2002 from Oxford, and this one's from the University of Otago Press. And we did a second edition uh, with a whole lot of new contributors to give some of the new PhDs a go uh, in part but also because of the Christchurch earthquake which changed things so dramatically and showed in the most forceful manner possible the power of nature and foolishness of people who ignore uh, the possibility of such things happening because the damage was much worse than it should have been as a result of people building houses in places that should have been left as wetland. Okay, And as they converted them into housing estates, all that happened after the earthquake is they went back to swamp. And, and so the, it was a catastrophic impact, but much worse than maybe it should have been. So if the, we'd ever learned anything from the past, and that's what we've attempted to do in both these books, is to connect past, present and future to some extent. Not, not that historians should ever attempt to predict the future. That's always a disaster. Uh, and we're not going there, but we are trying to suggest that if we have a bit of understanding of our environmental past, then maybe we'll manage the future a little bit better. Fingers crossed with global warming and everything else going on at the moment. So I had a much bigger presentation here. All I'm going to do today is first of all to uh, try and win you over by being a little bit flattering by suggesting that the first environmental historian in New Zealand is arguably a German. Uh, I had quite a bit about Maori and what happened with them before the Europeans came. The key point to remember there is they transformed New Zealand mightily with fire, chasing those giant enormous overgrown chickens called moa. They grew as high as about three metres and they were big birds and they knocked them out as you said rightly in 100 years or so uh, and they also maybe removed half the forest that was there. So that was the main point I was going to make about Maori. Their impact was not uh, benign by any stretch of imagination but by the time Europeans got there they were learning about the environment and they had much wisdom to pass on. The Europeans ignored it completely and repeated the same mistakes but with much more catastrophic impacts because there were many more of them and because they had more sophisticated technologies. Uh, and then I was going to tell you about this German and then I'm going to hop from this to my conclusions because we're here for a discussion today. Uh, but just to make you feel good, hopefully, this man was called Johann Karl Ernst Diefenbach. <laughs> he was a very interesting fellow, been the favourite pupil of Wust Wustus von Leibig, uh, the famous geologist. Uh, also agri agricultural chemist, I guess, amongst other things. And 
This particular uh, gentleman much advanced the understanding of people like Captain James Cook, who first rediscovered New Zealand for the British in 1769, and had on board a very wealthy botanist called Joseph Banks. And these two gentlemen actually misread New Zealand. They thought that New Zealand was super abundant, that it had wonderful resources. Uh, in fact, it doesn't. It's got quite poor soils. And they basically believed, according to the latest scientific ideas, that the giant rainforest, what we call the bush, uh, was the, a sign of high soil fertility. In fact, the opposite is true. That giant rainforest was leaching the soil. And they also were taking on board what they'd learned from North America, where in areas where you had giant forests, you tended to have more fertile soil. Well, the opposite was true in New Zealand. And so they overrated the place's potential. They thought it was a natural farm. It isn't and wasn't. And it had to be remade as such. So he wrote a book coming to New Zealand in 1840, working as a promoter, really, for a very dubious outfit called the New Zealand Company, who first settled New Zealand trying to make money by on-selling land. And so someone in London would buy a piece of land in Wellington in the middle of New Zealand that would be a cliff face. Uh, and it's not surprising that this company did not work very well and went bust within 10 years. But and amongst all the propaganda and the dubious dealing, there was one still true voice, and it was that of Diefenbach, and he wrote this book, Travels in New Zealand. I like to call him a proto-ecologist. And why is it so important? Because of the simple point. He realised that New Zealand was not abundant or especially fertile. Why? Because it lacked giant river systems. No Rhone, no Rhine, uh, no Danube equivalent, no Mississippi, Missouri equivalent, uh, no La Plata equivalent as in Argentina and Uruguay and so on. So uh, we just got these rivers that run out of the mountains that, that are sort of reasonably shallow and that spread rocks everywhere other than in one or two pockets. There is some fertile soil, ironically enough, in a place called Poverty Bay which Captain Cook got a bit wrong, but he was attacked by Māori, uh, there was still a lieutenant back then actually, he got attacked by Māori there at Poverty Bay, and he went up the road to a place where he was well treated by the Māori, and he called that the Bay of Plenty, uh, and it's not particularly, he got it around the wrong way. But apart from Poverty Bay and a few pockets, there's not a lot of fertile land. He also realised that if the hills were, sorry, were, if the forest was removed from the hills, then you'd have a lot of erosion, and that's exactly <coughs> what happened and what some of the historical geographers I talk about in the bigger uh, slide presentation, like Kenneth Cumberland, realised when they got to New Zealand in the 1830s. So, arguably, our first environment historian was not a Scot, as Richard Grove would suggest, but a German. So there you are. So what are my conclusions then from all of this work I've been doing over the years? Okay, the first thing to note, and this is a point that Tom Griffith really uh, brings up in a couple of things he's written, is that in New Zealand, the environmental history emerges out of the academy, particularly out of the humanities. And this is different from Australia, where it's emerged from policy, ecology, and literature. And of course, you talk to Christoph, he's got some of those uh, backgrounds himself, particularly the literary side of things. Uh, so someone like Tim Bonnyhandy, for example, has done really interesting work on Australian literature in relation to the environment. But essentially it's emerged from Canberra, where the capital is, from Australian National University. So there's been an awful lot of work done on policy, particularly by people like Stephen Divers. And Europe, it seems to me, and Germany's may be a bit different, but in many parts of Europe, uh, environmental history has kind of emerged out of ecology. Indeed, we did have a student down from Austria a few years ago working on energy and New Zealand agriculture, and he didn't actually complete, sad to say, but he went back to Austria and ended up doing something different. But he came from an ecological background. And when I've been to European environmental history conferences, I've been struck that I 
could almost have been at an ecology conference or a science conference. So a lot of the work they do there is pretty much hardline mainstream science. Uh, New Zealand's not like that. Canada, it's mainly historical geographers who've done most of the work in environmental history, people like Graham Wynne, who is a contributor, by the way, in our book here on forests. Graham is married to a New Zealand woman, and as a result, uh, he's kept an interest in what goes on in New Zealand, started his career teaching at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch. So I think that we've been more like Britain and that historians and historical geographers who are important in Britain, Gordon Windus assures me, um, still, uh, they're not anywhere else. They seem to be in rapid decline in, in New Zealand. There's hardly any left. Even in Canada, Wynn has not been replaced at UBC. So this is an interesting and concerning trend for some of us. But it's, it's historians and historical geographers working together who provided the lead, and Eric Paulson that edited these two books with me is an historical geographer based at the University of Canterbury. In the USA, historians uh, have been much more. Not a lot of geographers in the United States. It seems very interested in geography, which outside the United States it is, which is a bit concerning in terms of the rest of the world. Uh, we won't get into Donald Trump. And anyway, uh, at, at exactly the time that, that environmental history takes off in the, in the United States in the 1970s, and as partly as the new Western history, geography went through a strange moment. And in that just as the public were getting very interested in environmental matters, American uh, geographers, like geographers everywhere else, moved away from the environment. They got so transfixed with postmodernist approaches to the world, they forgot about the hard structures that lie underneath everything and moved away. And I think a golden opportunity was lost there. Physical geographers, of course not, but I'm talking about human geographers. And this was a whole interesting development that happened at the time. I said I'm keeping this brief because we want to talk. Now, if you go through the rest of this presentation, you'll see that one of the interesting things about it is the first really popular successful general history of New Zealand was written by a politician, poet and historian called William Pember Reeves, who came from Christchurch. And the book was called The Long White Cloud. It came out in 1898 and it goes into four editions and was usually popular. And the first chapter is a mini environmental history talks about declining water quality in the 1890s okay, as a result of the transformation of New Zealand. Uh, and there's another book written a few years later in 1909 by a man called Guy Schofield called New Zealand and Evolution where he's really concerned about deforestation and what's going on and then this disappears from all general texts, including my milestones, I'm ashamed to say, uh, down to uh, about Michael King's very popular penguin history put out in 2003, which he talks about the work that Eric Pawson and I have done. So uh, it, it disappears. So if you read something like Jamie Bellich, for example, in his big two-volume history of New Zealand, I saw him on the way over, actually he was in the same flight as me. Uh, he, does, he talks lots about the environment when he's talking about Māori, before the Europeans, as soon as Europeans come in, the environment disappears. And this, why? It's a fascinating problem. It's something to do with the belief that somehow or other culture subsumes and dominates nature. A very dangerous idea, I think, that has been completely overturned by the Christchurch earthquakes, amongst other things. And there's an another reason. We still have academic silos in New Zealand. Now, some of us have worked very hard to break these down, but trying to get environmental studies out of the control of scientists has not been easy, uh, but we've had some limited success in doing this. But there's still a lack of a bridge between the humanities and the sciences, and this starts in secondary school. So kids tend to get separated when they're at high school into scientists or people doing humanities or commerce and it's, it's very hard to break break that down and the sciences are privileged over the rest 
So the smartest kids basically do science and the less able are left to do humanities and commerce. That's, that's the thinking behind it. It doesn't work out necessarily like that, but that's, that's the idea. So we lack this bridge between the two parts of the academy, if you like. And, and, and indeed, my, half my students doing environmental history in New Zealand are Americans who are coming down for one semester away uh, from their own institutions and uh, they're mainly doing majors in environmental studies, but they come from a range of backgrounds. And most of the Kiwi students are not history students. They're nearly all geographers or ecologists or botanists. Uh, and because historians, well, history students, I think, are scared of the scientific names. And, uh, you know, I tell them, go and read Bill Bryson's A History of Nearly Everything, if you're going to do this course, just to give you a basic sense of science. And so the separation is, is really quite serious. And I think the other reason why there's been this gap is the powerful economic position of agriculture. You know, New Zealand still earns the bulk of its exports from stock farming, especially dairy, and from land use, you know, increasingly wine, yeah, but it's still small fry compared with dairy, which is now the most intensive on the planet and is having massive impacts on the land, much of it uh, adverse, uh, unfortunately, and not only on the land, but on water and water quality. Water supply and water quality. So, you know, we have uh, herds up to 3,000 in size, and the average is now about 500. Whereas the classic dairy farming pattern in New Zealand was little herds of about 50 or something like that. So it's since 1990, uh, things have, have really changed. And this, but this is a dreadful word that Eric and I invented, and, and it's ugly, but it catches it. The productionist paradigm remains very dominant in, in New Zealand. Uh, and behind that are all these powerful foundation most the, the, the ideal of improvement you talked about the garden earlier on and behind that ruralism that kind of uh, overweighting in a way of, of the, the advantages of rural life the notion that rural life is morally superior and sociologically preferable to the urban way of life. And the reason why people went so far on the longest sea voyage in history, very uncomfortable, I'm complaining about 40 hours flying to get here, it sometimes took people up to six months in a little sailing boat to get to New Zealand, at least three months uh, before steam, and that's up to about the 1870s. The reason why they undertook that dreadful voyage was so they could own land, predominantly, and become a farmer in a more independent kind of way than was possible back in Britain. And by Britain I mean England, Ireland, and uh, Scotland, where most of our folks came from. Did have some Germans, by the way. We got about a couple of thousand came down to help cut down the bush in Hawke's Bay in the 1870s. Okay. Uh, and all this has been reinforced by neoliberalism since 1984. New Zealand is now one of the most neoliberal political entities on the planet, believe it or not, having been one of the most statists before that. All right, the third major conclusion why New Zealand is so popular is a case study with overseas environmental historians. You can dispute that if you like, but, but lots of them have been down and they're all detailed in the fuller uh, presentation. First of all, just to reinforce what Christoph said, the transformation has been so extensive and rapid. Okay. On top of that, New Zealand is a relatively small and new experimental laboratory, and you have the sense of experimentation about everything in New Zealand that still goes on. It, it applies to politics, it applies to... You know, we were known as the social laboratory of the world because we were the first country to give women the vote, for example, in 1893. And that sense of experimentation certainly relates to the, to the environment. But it's the extent of the transformation and the speed of the transformation that's very very interesting to environment historians. Secondly, uh, because that transformation, uh, at least under European influence, has been so recent, most of it has been caught visually, that is, in etchings, paintings, photographs, maps, I'm sorry I've got time to show you these, but there's plenty in the presentation if you want to look at it, uh, moving pictures and more recently television. Put that all together, the whole story is caught the image of it is there for us to look at. And we have uh, amazing photographic records that we're only beginning to use properly now with techniques coming out of metrology and that side of geography. And 
equally important, most of the story has been written down, uh, stored in our excellent libraries, and we do have great museums in, in New Zealand. The people that came there were very interested in the natural world. This was the time when being a naturalist was perhaps at its, its height of fashion. I have to be careful how I say that to Germans, I realise naturalist probably means nudist to you, but I mean people, <laughs> people who go out and uh, you know study the natural world, and lots of them did it, and they were very interested because it was so different from home. And very quickly we formed museums in cities like mine. Once we made a bit of money from gold, one of the first things we did was to establish a big museum still there. Uh, and you'll find the same is true up in Auckland and Wellington and Christchurch and a lot of small places as well. And the key point here is this little society in the modern world was one of the most literate in history. At the time it was probably the most literate on the planet. Even Australia wasn't quite as literate because it was initially established as a penal colony and lots of the criminals couldn't read. Uh, but the people who went to New Zealand were mainly free settlers and most of them, male and female, could read. And so that makes for a difference from many other places. And so nearly everybody went there. This is post-enlightenment. Don't forget that. We're talking about New Zealand only exists from 1840. So it's an incredibly recently settled place. On top of that, the bulk of them came in the 1870s, so after Darwin if you like, rather than before Darwin. And this helps explain one reason why Darwin's ideas were so rapidly and readily accepted in New Zealand compared with many other places. Nearly there. Gaps. Lots and lots of these. Water. We still need to know a lot more about water. Uh, and note the maritime turn that some of my younger colleagues are into. Uh, we need to think a lot harder about the seas that surround us. Of course, New Zealand is an unusual place in that although it's quite a long, skinny country, running you know something like 1,500 kilometres, 1,600 kilometres from end to end, uh, it's completely surrounded by sea. And its land area is, although small, is greater than that of England, uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, so it's not that small, and yet it's completely surrounded by sea, so we don't have borders, you know, like all you people do in Europe. Our border is the sea. The sea is also a bridge to the rest of the world, so it's something we need to look at much more carefully, and we've been damaging it mightily, the same as everybody else. The coast that abuts the sea. We need to have much more of a sense of estuaries and this is where I think we need a lot more conversation in both cases with ecologists, those working on fish and fishing and those working in estuarine environments. Uh, we need a lot more in gender. We've slowly built up the number of women contributors here and Katie Pickles' essay here on the Christchurch earthquakes is not only post-colonial but it has strong gender implications uh, and dimensions but we need a lot more than that. James Beattie, who's uh, maybe known to many of you, uh, is currently house and cat sitting for me, uh, did his, his student honours essay on attitudes towards the removal of the forest in early Dunedin and he found that women uh, pined its passing, were more upset about the, the bush being removed than the men. They thought it was beautiful and it provided things like bird song as well as alternative food sources and, and more than men did. We need a lot more work on that kind of thing. The impact of tourism, of course, is a new one, and ecotourism. Uh, new Zealand at the moment's economy is in a lot of trouble because dairying is not pulling in the big prices it did a few years ago because of world oversupply. Uh, but we're not as bad as might be for two reasons. One is rebuilding Christchurch post-earthquake, lots of construction work. The other is tourism is at an all-time high. What the impact of that is on the environment needs to be looked at much more carefully. But one example, Jardia was introduced into our water systems uh, by tourists travelling around in vans and not disposing of their waste carefully enough. Uh, Whereas in New Zealand I grew up in, I could go tramping anywhere and drink the water from the stream and never ever get sick, no longer true. Uh, so these are some of the kind of impacts that, that tourism has had upon us, much as it's been beneficial to the economy. My final point, what is and will be the impact of an extremely diverse that have 
largely kicked in since the neoliberals took over in the 1980s. Uh, New Zealand is becoming increasingly Asian and there's a whole string of different attitudes towards the environment that's causing flashpoints between the indigenous people and the recently arrived immigrants. But we have taken in, although not large numbers of refugees, we've taken them in from everywhere. And we are now one of the most, maybe like modern Germany, one of the most ethnically diverse countries in the world. There is one school in Wellington that has 160 different nationalities in it. So the idea of New Zealand as a sort of white country with a few Maori floating around needs to be rethought. Uh, by 2040, New Zealand will be a brown country, not a white one, in the sense that uh, Maori will make up about 25% of the population. Pacific Island is about 10. Once they get us 35, and Asians about 15%. So uh, the white New Zealanders like me will be in a minority, uh, and maybe earlier than that, depending on immigration streams. So what's the impact of all this going to be when you're getting a whole new set of traditions and attitudes being applied to the environment? So I think that's going to be something we need to look at a lot more. And there, I had better stop, having gone over time a little. Okay, thank you very much.